точно от 19 часа с нощи започна спирането на 3 и 4-ти блок на Ецко злодой. Намалябането на мощността на турбините от 220 мегавата до 0 стана под звуците на траурна музика, а бившият изпълнителен директор на централата Иван Иванов се разплака. От днес България остана без най-ефтините 880 мегавата мощност в цялата енергийна система, за да изпълни договора за присъединяването ни към Европейския съюз. The reasons why you shut down the Bulgarian third and fourth reactors. Why? That was the most important thing built in Bulgaria in the last century. Well, why? I can tell you that uh, uh, you refer to Kozlodui, of course, now. Indeed, yeah. Well, I have followed uh, the, the story there because uh, at the time when uh, uh, the assistance program financed by the international community was launched by uh, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. I was nominated chairman of uh, the uh, assembly of donors who have uh, uh, financed uh, the special fund, the so-called nuclear safety account, which was used also for uh, safety improvements in, in the Kosluduy nuclear power plant. And uh, the commitment of uh, your government at the time was that uh, they were going to shut down those four units. Well, if at all, <laughs> good question. I mean, if you uh, negotiate a certain situation and uh, you accept conditions which you would not accept otherwise, then it's difficult to say what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. But I think uh, countries were too much fixed on let's join the European Union and not necessarily fully understanding all the implications and consequences. Yeah. Then, then the European Union came in and uh, when discussions took place with, with your country for your uh, for you, for you becoming part of, of the Union, then uh, this commitment was, was renewed with the uh, European Union. And uh, one, of the late, at one of the latest public appearances of the late uh, Ms. Loyola de Palacio, yes. the former Commissioner of Energy, and uh, she mm, essentially flatly and uh, dispassionately uh, rejected any possibility that the Commission would uh, renege or, or step down from this insistence of the shutdown of 3 and 4 because of all the political consequences of that. But she added, and I thought the Bulgarian friends developed some confidence or some hope there, she said maybe uh, the no to the restart of 3 and 4 could be accompanied with assistance for future nuclear power in Bulgaria. She said that. And I think at that time everyone was thinking, well, if they go ahead with Belenay, maybe the European Union could assist them. But she was very clear. It, it was, she was not improvising the answer. And she had thought it through. And it was no to this. It's, it's water under the bridge. There's no way we can reverse this without agitating the agreements with the other countries, the other member states that entered with other conditions. But maybe the path should be to create the conditions for assistance. Some of us thought your atom loans or other type of assistances for future development of nuclear. Uh, you know, uh, the plants that you have committed to shut down could be operating in a safe manner, of course, with a good safety revision. But uh, you have an agreement with the union. So you have to balance that uh, 
you know, it is necessary to make concession uh, to people when you want other things. Uh, now, I think there is expectation from, from Brussels and, uh, and the EBRD as well, uh, in a sense, that uh, those four units uh, are definitely shut down on a permanent basis. Now, that's a typical economic problem where you say now are the benefits of being in larger than the benefits I get from uh, the cost of doing the plant. And if that was the expectation, then from a macroeconomic perspective, probably the decision was right. Still, from a micro level, from an uh, electricity generator, uh, that decision was painful. So, frankly, I am not completely informed of when how I, things have evolved because I was following these activities the some many years ago, I would say. This is history. Right and, uh, well, it's, uh, let's say, a political approach which uh, was based in a different world. Now, uh, these two things, uh, climate change and uh, security of supply, are much more important than they were uh, 20 years ago. And well, we have to live with that. You know? But uh, good luck with that. Uh, I know that you have uh, plans for new nuclear power plants. So, to some extent, you are going to be able to uh, develop an additional nuclear program. So, don't look too much to the past, uh, look to the future. And what lies ahead of us? Over the past few years, questions have been asked ever more forcefully whether global climate changes occur in natural cycles or not, to what degree we human beings contribute to them, what threats stem from them, and what can be done to prevent them. Leading world experts warn us that global warming is a more serious threat than terrorism. New evidence of climate change suggests it could be even more serious and the greatest danger that civilization has faced so far. The scientists who formed the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change said that global temperature would rise between 2 and 6 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. Sir James Lovelock told me, if it will be 2 degrees per century, fine, we could do it. If it is 6 degrees per century, sorry, nobody can say it. Nobody can say if we can even survive but we know that we are on the wrong track. There is a very strong scientific consensus today that we are increasing greenhouse gases at a rate that will lead to catastrophe for the civilization. This has been horrifying. We now know that there are 380 parts per million in our atmosphere of greenhouse gases. Earth system scientists tell that when we cross the line of 450 or 500 parts per million, we'll begin to unleash forces, the so-called positive feedback that will intensify the rate at which greenhouse gases grow and at which the earth warms. So we have a very narrow period of opportunity here because we are growing with two to three parts per million per year. That could have been taken us across the deadly threshold within the next 25 to 30 years if we don't turn around the way the earth produces energy. All of the world's economies, developed countries and developing are equally culpable now. The end of the world has been anticipated many times in the course of history and has never come, of course. And it won't come this time either. We need not fear for our planet. It was here before us and most likely will be here after us. But that doesn't mean that the human race is not at serious risk. You said in your book that, that uh, uh, you need, we need an urgently a new Bible. 
what are going to be the Just ten level of commandments? Oh. <laughs> Well, the first, I think, and uh, only one would be respect the earth. So don't think all the time of humanity. The good of humanity is not the most important thing we have to keep in mind. It's the health of our planet, because uh, if we don't have a healthy planet, we have no future at all. In this moment, the world is burning every single year four cubic kilometers of oil so you took a cube of 1.6 kilometer 1.6 kilometer and 1.6 kilometer of oil every year if you convert that in gas you have to multiply by three basically do you believe that that is normal in addition, do you really believe that that is normal? Development is chaos. And as you develop, you will make mistakes, you will abuse resources, the environment, and so on. That's a fact. How we can replace that energy? If somebody will give me a solution, I will be very pleased. I cannot see any other solution than nuclear energy. And the competition in base load is coal, natural gas, and nuclear power. And the three of them are needed. But nuclear has the advantage that it's cheaper than natural gas, and it doesn't produce the CO2 that coal produces. So this is why nuclear is coming back. They're also being misled by the global uh, oil companies, which are spending billions of dollars to convince the, the public that they are somehow converting themselves to providers of clean energy. The greatest fraud being uh, perpetrated in this entire debate is the idea that we are going to see the coal companies and the oil companies uh, and the natural gas companies somehow capture all that carbon and, and secure it safely away in some little cavern in the, in the earth. This is a fraud. You need energy. From where that energy is going to come? We continue to burn four cubic kilometers of oil, and next year five cubic, and the other year eight cubic kilometers of oil. Solar, I can make a very simple calculation. Go to the, tell me the more sunny country of Europe. Italy? I have a map here of Italy, I can show you how much energy I get from the sun, very easy to calculate, eh? You can, you, you can measure. Let's make a hypothesis. We take all the Italians out of Italy, and we cover all Italy with solar panels, all. Then we multiply so many watts per square meter, multiply the surface of Italy, give you a number. That number is lower than the energy that the Italians are already consuming today. For solar is nice for, you know, but not reality. Solar panels and windmills and biofuels, this is an illusion. And this will pass because it is entirely unrealistic. The public has begun to recognize the seriousness of the greenhouse gas and global warming problem. Unfortunately, they are being misled both by institutionalized environmentalism that, that these half measures like solar panels and windmills and biofuels can make a big difference. <laughs> it's you know, as we say, pulling figure, figures out of, out of the air. The, the, the windmills are notoriously unreliable. Yeah. Last, last winter, we've got 1,322, I think it is, windmills at that time. And on one day last winter, they only produced 2% of their rated capacity. People talk about saving, etc., but they go they queue in the shops to buy new 
uh, washing machine, new TV, new this, new that, you know. Now we have a TV in the bathroom, a TV in the living room, a TV in the dormitory. So people want to live well. For the consumption of energy will continue to grow. We can limit the least to make, I mean, we certainly we cannot continue to throw in away energy as can be, has been done in this moment. For instance, when you go to America and you see all these motels, you know, with the 100 rooms empty and with air conditioning boom, 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 going around. This is a wall like that. That is throwing away energy. And if you see in the literature, there is what we call the Kuznets curve. If you think of uh, sort of environment degradation on one axis and economic development on the other, it goes this reverse U. In the beginning, you pollute more. Once you reach a certain level of income, you want it cleaner. Then you start putting in a filter in your car. Then you put uh, abatement measure in your power plants. Then you force industry not just to discharge their dirty water into the next river. So in order for us to really effectively combat climate change or other environmental issues is really to help developing countries to develop and so they can take matters in their own hand. And nuclear power in that regard is one means to that end. Expectation about expanded use of nuclear power is a reality. I mean, if you, if you look at China today, they're expanding their nuclear power capacity five times by 2020. If you look at India, they're expanding their nuclear power capacity eight times by 2022. These are reality. These are facts. You see Finland is building a new nuclear power reactor, the first time in, in Europe for after three decades. You see France is about to build a new EPR, I think, next year in 2008. <coughs> We see at least, as mentioned today, at least five to ten countries are seriously going for nuclear for, for the reason I mentioned. It's a, there is an increased demand for, for energy. There is a concern about, about uh, uh, climate change. There is a competition for resources. Uh, uh, either you can have, you have no energy, and then, you know, without energy, as I mentioned, there is no development, there is misery, and there is conflict. And, or you would like to have energy, a clean source of energy with certain risk of a severe accident, but that we always try, as with any technology, uh, to maximize the benefit and minimize the risk. The question is whether decisions are going to be made actually to accelerate the renaissance. If we build a thousand or two thousand nuclear reactors in this century, it's not going to make the difference. We need to build eight or ten thousand nuclear power plants in the 21st century, or we are going to have a climate catastrophe. We will be requiring 10 times more electricity in, in uh, four to five decades from now, 10 times. So today we are generating something like uh, between 130 to 140 gigawatts. We would require 1,300 to 1,400 gigawatts by the middle of the century. And the question is from where this energy, energy will sources come? So, I think John Rich is right. But in a hundred years time frame, everything is possible. If we really uh, need the energy and want it. And 8,000 reactors. I mean, in the high days of nuclear power, we added some 50 reactors a year. The world already has grown twice in terms of economic output. So everything else being equal, which never is, but let's assume, you could already double that. And if you look at the economic projection by 2100, that's another factor of three or four increase of, of, of world output. So if you just put this up, I don't see any sort of back of the envelope calculation limitation on that. I think we have a nuclear renaissance coming. I would not say that the nuclear renaissance is already here. But we see all the signs, all, all the lights are turning green, all over the world. But in Asia it never stopped. So it's not a renaissance, they are just proceeding. Uh, we are right now building uh, six units. Uh, we are building uh, three uh, heavy water reactors. We are building two light water reactors. And we are building one 500 megawatt fast builder reactor. 
and then government has given approval for four more. It will mean that China is largely driven by nuclear power, India is largely driven by nuclear power, the United States, Japan, South Korea, Russia, they will, be, they will become like France. And along the way, a country with a very sophisticated nuclear technology, Bulgaria, will be a part of it. China is with this uh, very strong nuclear program, which includes 30 new units by the end of uh, the next decade, hoping to go from 2% of nuclear electricity to 4%. Because, of course, they keep building these enormous amounts of coal-fired stations. Somebody two said a week, right? two a week. Two big plants, coal-fired plants, a week. I mean, it's difficult to comprehend. It's, it's enormous. The Chinese grab everything. They don't discriminate. They do solar, wind, geothermal, biofuels, nuclear, coal, everything, because they need energy. They don't care, really, what it is, as long as they can get it. I, I believe within the next 10 years, you'll see 30 or 40 nuclear power plants begin construction in the United States. But we need to accelerate it. We need, the United States is only 20% dependent on nuclear right now, and we need to move that up to a level like France of 80%, and we need to do it soon. Renaissance in the States, that's true, because in the States they haven't built a, a plant which had not been ordered before 74. Yeah. It's a very long time, and now we see that they are preparing really to rebuild. So Renaissance is coming, and in the mind and in the political, both in Washington and in Wall Street, the, the minds have changed. Now in Europe, you have... Now, now, now in Europe, which was somehow uh, much less clear picture five years ago, I think there again, the mood has changed. Everybody is completely convinced that Belgium will change its law. They have a lot of time to do it. Germany. Germany will probably be the tougher, the tougher uh, egg to crack. I think that when actually Sweden reverses its, its, its referendum of 1980 and says OK, that will have a big impact on Germany. So somehow, for me, things are moving. And we had a kind of vicious circle at some point when, each, when countries were somehow phasing out. Now we have reversed the circle. And when UK makes its first bid, when the United States makes its first build, then in Germany it, it, it will go. In France, uh, or Arriva altogether, I expect to have uh, yes, at, at least 30 reactors to build around the world, which is a huge endeavor. And that's why we are uh, rebuilding our support base. It's the first time that uh, we are using something which is mostly brain power. It is a little materials, a lot of brain power. That's different. Many yeah. people is starting to think that, hey, maybe, uh, you know, uh, what uh, we thought before was not based on really an objective uh, view of uh, nuclear power. And uh, this is happening in many countries. Uh, and this is relatively new. Eh? This is happening uh, in the last three years. I will give you a, a quote I like from Einstein, which says, it's more difficult to disintegrate uh, preconceptions than methods. And so it, uh, it, it's very important. It was difficult to disintegrate the atom, to extract energy from it. It will be very difficult to change the preconceived ideas that most people have about it, but it is important. A change in paradigm is precisely what has occurred uh, in two places, in Sofia and in Brussels. In Brussels, it's changed because there's new thinking about the value of nuclear, and there's a recognition, a growing recognition of the relationship between nuclear and the clean energy revolution we must have. And there's been a change in Sofia, too. Before, you were forced by circumstances to be beggars. Please let us into the European Union. And you, unfortunately, that caused you to be victimized by some stupidity coming out of the bureaucracy there and the, polit and the politicians there. You're no longer in that position. There's a new paradigm. You're a full and responsible member of the European Union. You have responsibilities to your people, to the environment, and to, the, and to your neighbors in the region. You have a safe technology, and you should be allowed to use it. In fact, you should insist upon the right to use it.
die Strecken vor allem starken, selbstbewussten und der You are um, in a psychological state that you really are uh, ready to give everything in order to, to, to be accepted as, as a candidate country and as a member. But Colso um, Dui and the, the, the problem of units three and four of Colso Dui are, are a clear example of how sometimes um, a negotiation, an accession a negotiation uh, it is done under under a, a certain perspective and when a few years uh, pass then this per perspective has changed and, and 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 then you are tied your hands are tied by the by the accession treaty you see so uh, the, the, we should need some flexible adaptation mechanisms in cases like like this because uh, everybody agrees now that this unit should not be uh, uh, closed. Everybody agrees, but but legally, we are with uh, with our hands, as I say, tied because of the accession treaty. I have already signed uh, many letters and parliamentary questions to the Commission uh, asking them to open up uh, the issue of Costa Dui because I really think that uh, the treatment uh, Pulcheria and the Pulcherian uh, nuclear power plant was given was not fair because these, uh, these plants are according to international atomic, atomic energy uh, experts totally uh, on the same level that some of the operating uh, nuclear reactors in other EU member states. The truth remains the truth in life and the truth deserves to be always defended even at the very high cost and the, and the truth must prevail at the end of the day because the way how this Kaduloi uh, nuclear st uh, stations were closed down I mean it's a disastrous way to do politics to the detriment of Bulgarian nation and at the one point of time, we in the Europe must admit that we made a big mistake. And what stops us from correcting our mistake? It's difficult for the European Council to, to delete its decisions. But amending is always te technically possible. And I have been asking only amending, so I mean changing some details in the decision. And I think that it's needed now. But in politics, sometimes what is done, it's like it was engraved in a marble, and then nothing will happen, regardless of the disastrous consequences of what happened in, in Bulgaria. So I think is that you just must keep the pressure on, and now when the climate for nuclear is much more favorable, because it's absolutely necessary for the mankind, for the future of mankind. We cannot solve our energy equation, equation without uh, nuclear. And now you need to get some allies, some other countries, some other people who awake to the fact that Bulgaria was so badly treated by EU Commission on that um, uh, nuclear issue. The existing fleet of nuclear power plants are money printing machines. They are usually amongst the cheapest generators in every country. So was the four, where the four reactors, Kosla uh, 1 to 4 in Bulgaria. So if you shut down your cheapest energy supplier, that is simply economically nonsense. Why do we spend the monies of the European taxpayers? I mean, this is wasting the money if we 
demand Bulgaria to shut down, and instead of that, we support building more more coal, which is which is not wise policy, and it's I think it's wasting wasting the taxpayers' money when we think that something that is is good and is it's environmentally sustainable. It is it is check that at the moment these these uh, reactors are are in good shape. Because uh, of the one and two, okay. But three and four, well, like 400 or 500 million euros have been put down to put them up to the norms. It's, it's, it's really ridiculous to shut them down. And uh, even more so, to shut them down before Bellini is operational. So I have, I have no, no reservation. If I were a Bulgarian, I would renegotiate. I think, I think look, it's no longer the old uh, plants which had been badly maintained. Let's, let's admit it for the first, uh, or badly is not uh, poorly, poorly maintained. And uh, I would certainly not uh, rediscuss those which are shut down. But those which have been revamped, those which have been put to really internationally accepted standard. Uh, I, w I was at Casa Dui. The, uh, the sense of pride of the, uh, of the workers there and the, uh, and the executives of it was obvious. Uh, without a doubt, uh, the uh, improvements that had been made in the plan over the previous seven, uh, several years were significant and uh, had moved the plan up very much uh, uh, with respect to its capabilities being operated as a safe uh, facility. As I said when I was there, I felt this and still do feel the uh, the plant can operate safely. And I can I support the, the confidence of the quality of the professionals that run Castle Dewey, the professionals that have managed the processes of upgrading the five and six unit. I can vouch to that. I mean, that's a powerful team of experienced professionals, no question about it. It's, it's like anything, uh, if I were to build a new plant today, would I build a better plant? Of course. If I was to build a new car today, it would be better than the car of 10 years ago. Is the car of 10 years ago unsafe to drive upon the highway? Well, if it's been maintained and if it's been operated properly, no, it's not. So. I was, uh, I was most impressed with Kozla Dewey. I felt comfortable enough that my wife went, me on the, went with me on the trip and we were, I was not worried for her safety at all. That's the best description I can give. This is what I call hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Or the minister, for instance, here of environment, that they are talking against the nuclear power plant in Bulgaria because of radiation, because it's very bad, no radiation for the people. But you can go here to the south to Badgerstein. They have a spa there. A lot of money, you know, big hotels, charge you a lot. And there they put you in caves. You know, you go to caves to have water and to... These caves are full of natural radioactive material. The dose that people receive there, the workers, is much big, higher than in Kosovo. Nobody talk about that. So you cannot talk against the, the hoteliers, you know. The hoteliers will kill you. Moreover, you arrive to the station in Badgashain, to the, to the railway station, and there is a kiosk of the government telling you how good is the radiation. Of course, the radiation from Badgashain. Once I said this to a minister uh, of environment here in Austria, I said, 
very interesting. I mean, uh, look what happened. The radiation from Kosovo is like that. The radiation from Russia is like this. He didn't know, but he checked with the advisors, and he was shocked. And he told me something that I will never forget in my life. He said to me, you know, Mr. Gonzalez, people in Austria like Bad Gastein, and they don't like Oslo, do we? Since I am a politician, I have to do what people tell to me. Come on. It's, it's extremely clear that sticking to decisions which are taken in a given context, the 1992 context, and we are in 2008 very soon, uh, let's reconsider. Uh, let's uh, make new assessment by any new uh, international body, one or other, uh, whichever, and uh, they will uh, come to the conclusion those units three and four have been revamped. So there is no technical safety basis to shut them down. If it's political, then renegotiate. I think that you could reopen the issue, but you should make sure that uh, people understand in the European Union that this is not only Bulgaria uh, and Bulgarian future which is at stake, but it's also the regional stability, it's also the EU stability. Well, energy security is not only a national issue, that's clear. It is a regional or international issue. And uh, the geopolitics of energy clearly demonstrates this. And what I mean by the security is that the nuclear gives us an independence, because that's what we mean. If we are supplied by our energy, because we cannot have any development in a society without, uh, without the energy. And if energy is supplied by somebody else, A, their hand is on the tap, and we don't know the price. Bulgaria has become enormously dependent on Russia yes. for her energy resources. Um, yeah, I'm more, more so, no, but more so than any other country. I mean, I know potentially there are many other European countries which are going to be very dependent on, for example, gas supplies. But, but you're going to have that and, um, well, in, in more so because of your loss of nuclear capability. Um, but every aspect of your energy production is being driven by uh, a, a Russian interest. And I don't think that's very healthy. I mean, I'm all for diversity of sources of supply and security of supply. It is a pity that uh, according to the accession uh, treaty, accession agreement, these units now are in the situation they are because um, this uh, energy uh, that um, was produced in Unit 3 and 4 of Kozlodui is absolutely necessary, not only for uh, Bulgaria, but for the whole region. So um, if something could be done to, to uh, amend such, a, such, a, such an error, uh, I think it should be done. I think uh, the right argument that you have got that the peace and democracy in the Balkan, the economic development of Bulgaria and through Bulgaria, the European Union, is require the solution which is reasonable, cost-effective solution for the, for the energy, energy base load in, the, in, in that part of the world. And I think you can get friends who would support and who would speak on behalf of you, together with you, in, in this issue. Certainly you have to get the courage. 
maybe it can be uh, cost -Louis. maybe it can be facilitating or accelerating the process to, to replace cost -Louis. But certainly the lack of energy in the Balkan, just in the neighboring of the European Union, uh, would, require, would require a kind of solution. And uh, I think that uh, we have to make it more visible for the European decision makers. We were facing a moment of uh, extreme difficulties in the last two years. The 2007 probably was, and is still, the most difficult year. This very, very, very drastic situation on uh, energy supply has forced the government to apply load sheddings, cuts of electricity, and uh, very significant sometimes. Uh, in the main cities, they are not less than four to five hours per day now. While in the other parts of the country, in the rural area, load shadings, they sometimes go up to eight hours per day. Сите туристите тука кај мене можат да поминат тамам, ама само еден проблем. Проблемот Има само за тока. Преко ова е време кога затворите централно атом, атом, атом централно на Булгарија и ние имаме голема проблем. Тука немаме струја 8 сата на, на ден. На ова е време убавезно требат ние да палим агрегатот, значи на онај бизнес уште дуплата треба да платиме 3000 евро на еден месечно. For sure it was uh, not something that got us by surprise uh, the closing of of closing the units because it was part of the agreement that Bulgaria has with the European Commission but uh, for sure considering the fact that the closing of this unit would have had an immediate impact in all the region, Greece particularly, Macedonia, Kosovo, uh, have been in difficulties on uh, guaranteeing and securing the supply of the population. Uh, we disagree with it on the political level, we disagree with it on the economic level, and we disagree on that on the democratic level. Uh, politically, I think it was totally unfair decision and certainly was not based on safety as it was publicized and advertised during the decision-making process. Uh, it politically was unfair in my view because it suggested uh, uh, such a, it, or it suggested such a decision uh, to Bulgaria which was not a real choice. Bulgaria wanted to be a member of the European Parliament and at that very moment Bulgaria would pay any price to be a yes, member. Indeed, yeah. Yeah, so I think it was a very unfair condition. And from democratic point of view, I think it was also wrong because now we see that maybe you have energy enough for Bulgaria, but certainly the neighboring countries are suffering from lack of energy, and for them energy means also access to democracy. Ние сме, защото ние сме били тези, които са ми доставили. Ти не можеш... Я ми обясни какъв, каква energy security, каква сигурност на енергийните доставки ние изпълнихме към държави, на които доставяхме. Ами то по същия начин утре Русия ще каже, аз донеска ви доставях, от утре марш. Ето това се случи в момента, нали? Сигурността на енергийните доставки на Балканите, някой ги разпепелеса като едното нищо.
И защо? Защото трябва да задоволи интереса на еди коя си партия или на еди коя си фракция в Европейския парламент. Обърни внимание. На еди коя си фракция в Европейския парламент. Да е жива и здрава фракцията. Да седне да си промени мнението. Да, да, да се вслуша в собственици специалисти. Защото не ние казахме, че са безопасни. Техните специалисти казаха, че са безопасни. This electricity must be substituted by another uh, generation um, sources that will uh, emit uh, CO2 in large, in, in, in lignite, yes, that will uh, emit uh, CO2 in large amounts. So it's, it's a real disaster from all points of view. So I think that um, um, the, the Bulgarian government and also Bulgarian members of parliament with the help of many colleagues um, should do everything in our hands to try to find some legal way uh, in, in, the, in, the frame of the, in the framework of the, of the treaties and the accession treaty to find some way to sort out this, this problem. Because it really, I, I can only say, this is a tragedy. Um, any treaty is open to renegotiation. Um, there is a specific clause in the accession protocol, um, Article 36, um, which in certain circumstances would enable um, renegotiation of an aspect of, of the treaty. Um, but of course these are normally safeguard clauses and what the Commission itself normally um, initiates but the Commission uh, is responsible for the situation in Southeast Europe. Well, exactly. And it's a yeah. So, um, you know, I don't entirely give up hope on this, but it does require um, a meeting of minds and constant pressure from politicians in Bulgaria um, and to find like minded people in the, the Parliament, in the uh, Council. We need the leadership now. We need leadership in Bulgaria, and Bulgaria needs allies in this fight to review this case, because we cannot live with this kind of consequences. People are literally, literally dying in Balkan due to uh, energy shortage and the fact that the fossil fuels are now being burned, and so forth and so forth. I mean, it was absolutely absurd decision, but nothing stops us correcting it. I mean, we owe it to ourselves. We owe it to human dignity that we are, that when we make a mistakes, we correct it. But I think, you see, the answer is there ought to be um, a review by um, an independent team, completely independent, that should look at the whole question, um, look at the energy needs of Bulgaria and how they're being met, look at the energy needs of the region, look at the economic impact uh, on Bulgaria, look at the questions of security of supply, um, diversity of supply. All of these questions ought to be there. And then we ought to also look at the, um, the possibilities, the practical possibilities of um, bringing those reactors back into use again. You are part of the European Union and there is the same level, every state is exactly the same. They are not uh, second level state or first level states. Uh, Bulgaria is exactly at the same level, the same right, the same duty than France, than Italy, than uh, Belgium, the first member, but also like the United Kingdom, Ireland and so on. So you have exactly the same right and the same duty. About Kosovo, uh, let me remind what uh, Margaret Thatcher did uh, when uh, she entered in the European Union. Margaret Thatcher said they signed the treaty and then when the United Kingdom was in the European Union, she renegotiated the money. And she win. And she said, I want my money back. <laughs> and she won and she get the money back. And some of your leaders have uh, even invoked specific clauses of the treaty that could provide a path to change yeah. this. But it is a very big political stake for your leadership to actually go and say, I want this revised. We are facing a real problem. 
and the politician must know we have the solutions the solution is there the money is there you politician you politicians you are in charge of this problem you have the solution we technician and the financial we give you the solutions i don't think that i don't i don't think a renegotiation is necessary i think Bulgaria simply needs to go to the European Union and inform them of their plans to reopen these reactors now that Bulgaria is a, a member. Bulgaria met its, its requirement by closing them down and that was forced upon Bulgaria unfairly and unjustly. But now Bulgaria, Bulgaria is a member of the European Union. It should go to, the, the, uh, go to Brussels, simply say we have urgent energy and environmental needs not only in Bulgaria but in our region we have responsibilities these are tremendously valuable assets we intend to reopen them we're happy to demonstrate to the satisfaction of everyone that this will be done in a safe and effective manner but we intend to do this now if you wish to if you wish to enter into an agreement under which we pledge the safety uh, and professional operation of these reactors we are pleased to do so but don't stand in the way of responsible energy and environmental policy on the part of the government in Sofia, because we have some serious business to do, and we cannot afford to be subject to silly uh, restrictions coming from um, misguided bureaucrats in Brussels.